You already know what it is. It's the Certified Podcast, and I'm your host, Mike Ginn. This is episode number two. We survived the first episode, now we're on to the second with none other than the big hurt himself, Brian Carr. We're talking about sports and hip-hop and podcasting and much more, so stay tuned. It's all coming up next. Welcome to the Certified Podcast. On this episode, I am joined by the Big Hurt himself, Brian Carr. How you doing today, my friend? Doing all right, man. How you doing? Doing good. Uh, for the for the purpose, we will call him Hurt throughout the episode. I've known Brian for a number of years, so excuse me if I slip up once in a while. But uh, uh, yeah, definitely. How you doing, man? Everything good? Everything's good. Everything's good. And slip ups are fine. You know what I'm saying? It's all good. <laughs> uh, definitely. Uh, this this is a uh, Going to probably be episode, one of the first few episodes to air. Uh, this is going to air in 2018, so we'll try not to act like this isn't the end of 2017, but I definitely want to get your opinions on a few things. Uh, most notably, uh, for those that don't know, Brian has been in the studio a few times, dropped a CD, has a few uh, music tracks out there. You should definitely look them up uh, if you can find them. Uh, if not, I'll definitely be happy to provide some links for those. Uh, you can follow him at Twitter at Hertz House. So definitely follow him. Follow the podcast. Uh, I've definitely checked out a few episodes, and watching you rant is always something special. You know, it, I always go into these podcasts. I go into them thinking like, I'm not going to rant. I'm just going to talk. And then, like halfway through, usually at the end of the season when the Redskins are eliminated and Redskins fans go crazy on why we got eliminated, that's that's when the rants start coming out and they get. They get more more putrid every year. Man, I've been saying that for years about the Redskins, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I actually, and no shade, I envy the position the Giants are in because they get to reset, and no one's going to complain. They had a good run, that and no one, no one gets to argue about it. You know, with the Redskins fans, you have a bunch of people who want to keep going in the direction that we're going, which is downhill. Uh, you know, records got worse three years in a row, but you know. And, and for those he, one, for those wondering what we're talking about, we're both located in the DMV. Uh, Brian, hometown Redskins. Me, oh. I, I'm a, I'm a road team. I like the Giants. Uh, but yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I actually, I'm happy the last couple of weeks because they've been competitive, but still lost. And that that to me is the best case scenario because that Giants like there's no point in being like halfway bad, right? Like you don't yeah. want you don't want to get like a crappy draft like a mid draft pick on a crappy team. You want to be bad, get a franchise player that can change the franchise. So you know, and we're doing the exact opposite. We're being very lackadaisical and winning. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's the opposite of what I want to have happen. I mean, right now there's so many teams down to that that two, three, four, five win range. Like who knows how that's going to end up. Exactly. Some of these guys are like coaching because they want to keep a job. So you got like Jay Gruden, like he has to win to like basically keep his job. No, no coach in the Dan Snyder era has ever lasted five years. So I saw that the other day. I was like, oh, really? I didn't even like realize it until I like I know, thought about it. Yeah, he's actually the first to even get an extension, even though it's a it's a meaningless extension. It's like a one year extension. Yeah, it's like the Tom so- Coughlin ones that kept like rolling them over. Yeah. But I, I don't know if he's going to make it. I, I honestly, as much as I dislike Jay, I hope he does because it's the same thing with Kirk Cousins. If you don't re sign him, then who's next? Alex Smith, uh, Tyrod Taylor. You hope a draft pick pans out. Um, if you fire Jay Gruden, who's next? Who's going to come here and coach if they feel like Jay Gruden didn't get a proper chance to turn the team around and didn't get everything he needed to turn the team around? Well, you won't hear me say too many good things about uh, the Redskins, but I will say when you have a weak defense and your solution is fire the defensive coordinator, but keep the guy who worked underneath them as the defensive coordinator, I, I, I don't, I don't know how that is a, a plus or a positive. Like, I don't understand how you can keep Greg Minoski and all of a sudden be like, hey, 
you know, this is an improvement. It's the same guy that worked under Joe Barry. Like, it's the same same team. Um, there is the same team, but the scheme was somewhat different. I think Greg Minuski uses players a little bit better. Um, also, he wasn't he he plays his best guys. He plays his best guys regardless of you know who he signed to be safety. When the season started, you had Monte Nicholson in there, you had Sasha Everett in there. Um, the fans were really bad on Fuller. And, you know, Graydon Nusky moved him to the inside where he's been spectacular all year. One of the top rated um, corners in the PFF based off of where they put him. Uh, you know, his team typically, typically is a lot more ready to go and sharper and better and ready than the offense is. So I don't know if he's a great coach X's and O's, but he's definitely more of a leader of men than Joe Barry was. And definitely more of a leader of men than Jay Gruden is, in my opinion. I'll so absolutely, I, I, I'll absolutely agree. He's much more of a leader. He definitely has that team ready to play much more every week. And, and let's be real. The Redskins, much like many teams in the NFL, if they didn't have as many injuries as they have on both sides of the ball, I mean, especially offensive line, much like you know the Giants have with receivers and everything else, the Redskins would probably be at least an 8-18. Eight eight I mean, you guys are in so many games. Yeah. And I don't, I don't like talking about how the schedule was so hard, but I'm satisfied with the teams that we lost to for the most part. Um, you know, they typically, you know, I've seen the Redskins compete with the Steelers or compete with the Patriots and then lose to, you know, a Cincinnati team or something like that, a team that's not going anywhere, yeah. a team that has three, four wins at the end of the season, and one of them was the Redskins. So far, everybody we've lost to um, outside of Dallas now is a playoff contender or a lock for the playoffs and a couple of first place teams in that list. Yeah, I mean, they've been, like I said, they've been competitive all but like maybe one game. Like, you know, they, they've pretty much been in almost every game. Yeah, I mean, that Chargers game was an absolute travesty, but, you know, it, it's, it's, that was revenge. It's what it is. <laughs> That was straight up revenge. That was from God. What was it? Last time they played, what four years ago? Mm -hmm. I was actually at that game. I was sitting pretty close, and that was the game that the Chargers actually technically should have won. Going like down the end of the game, Danny Woodhead scored a touchdown that later the the refs reviewed and, and said he was stepped out or the. The ball was short. I don't remember exactly. It was a while ago. And then they, they kick a field goal, tie the game. And then, of course, this is after the new overtime rules, but still the Redskins, and this is, you know, back when RG3 was quarterback, but they went right down the field, him and Alfred, mainly Alfred Morris. Like, he broke off, like, two or three, like, decent runs on the drive, and they went right down the field on the opening drive in overtime and scored a touchdown game was over, which was hilarious to me because half, half the Redskins fans left the stadium thinking the game was over, and then they all came flooding back in once it went into overtime. So that was, that was hilarious to me. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure you're not surprised, but yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. It's, <laughs> and, yeah, RG3. <laughs> the, the other name that gets me to the rant. Yeah, no. And, and I was going to get into sports later. I was actually going to start off with hip-hop with you, but since we're already here, we can go to hip-hop later. Um, right. You know, I keep, I keep telling people this isn't really necessarily an interview. Uh I'm not going to ask you what your favorite color is. I don't really care. Uh, I just really want to have conversations with people that that really, you know, have something to add. You know what I'm saying? Like people that can, you know, have a conversation on. Uh, I definitely want to have, you know, Big Hurt. I want to have him on a few times because I think the listeners can benefit from any time you're on with us. Uh, over the years, people that don't know, we've uh, worked together a few times. I've had, uh, had him write a few articles for different websites. Uh, he's done sports stuff for me. He's done hip-hop stuff for me. Uh, I, I interviewed him a number of years ago with uh, the original magazine, Pure Style, back when he was doing his rap music. Uh, I keep trying to get him to come out of retirement. <laughs> we'll see. You know, I, um, we're, we're, actually, uh, we're actually working on a project. Um, <clears throat> the old group, the, uh, uh, the Insiders, which would so be this, myself. This is before the, before the B team? Uh, before the B team, it, it actually the B team spun out of. Um, it wasn't a break from the insiders, but just a separation of direction. They were doing music their way. I started doing music my way, and that's where the B team kind of spun from. It was a 
it was a uh, I'm not gonna say it was a jealousy thing, but I definitely <laughs> felt like I wasn't getting like certain resources, whether that's true or not. But we're actually uh, working on a documentary based on that, and based on a lot of old footage I have of us in the studio. Um, oh, that's and I, cool. I, I, since everybody's on board and we're getting to sit around and listen to some of our old tracks and talk, <clears throat> I feel like there's a path back to music that's kind of developing, that's kind of like developing itself. Yeah, that is. So. Everybody, not just you, but like the team. Not that itch. The, the the team. Like I, I was see us sitting around and we're listening to some of the old music. Like, hey, this was actually a good song. Fifteen years later, oh, this is still a good song. I still have seventeen CD years later. Uh, I do, yeah, I do still have a CD. I need another copy though because I think it has like a scratch on it and like skips a couple tracks. But you know, it's funny. We we've been sitting around listening to tracks that we never released because our plan was like we're going to go out. We record this album. This album's beautiful. At the time, we were talking to somebody who was working with BET about shooting a video and how much it would take to get it on the air or what the parameters would be. And we were we were like, OK, so we're going to sit on this album. In the meantime, we're going to release this mixtape. And we released the mixtape and we sold the mixtape and it made enough money for us to finance more projects. And that's when we kind of broke apart. So we had this album that we made for, you know, for when we got on and it never got released and nobody ever heard it. So now we're going back and we're listening to it. We plug in one of these old hard drives and it has all this beautiful music on it, some terrible music also, but some <laughs> beautiful music on it. And we're like, yo, we really never, no one's ever heard these songs. And um, so we're going to do a documentary and that album's probably going to be the soundtrack to it. All right, that'd be that'd be that'd be dope. That'd be crazy. Um, speaking of your music, um, you know, unfortunately, I, I I had this conversation with uh, Shaq Carbo, who's my last interview. Uh, you might know him. He also grew up in Annandale and Northern Virginia. Uh, he's probably about a decade younger than us and doing his thing now. He's going. He just moved out to the Bay Area. But not to get sidetracked, you know, we had this conversation about social media and how it is how easy it is for artists to kind of get out there now without a label, without people, you know, you know, doing things for them, they can do it for themselves. And, you know, there's a double edged sword to that, right? You know, sometimes you get watered down content because of that, because everybody thinks they can be a superstar with social media. And then you also have the people that are legitimate needle and haystacks that sometimes they get found. Sometimes they don't, you know, you're talking about putting a video out on BET. If this was, you know, 10 years later, you could have put it out yourself on YouTube or whatever. Um, and built your own audience, right? You know, you wouldn't even need exactly. It, you know, so maybe it is a good time to kind of get back on that. You know, you can release your documentary on YouTube or any other number of services. You know, yeah, we we always well, our producer always said he always said while we were while we were rapping, he always said we came out ten years too early and also ten years too late. Like if we had gotten together in the early nineties and yeah. rapping the way we were rapping, yeah, you had a we would abs- absolutely got on. If we had waited ten years and started rapping together with all the the you know, how much easier it is for resources, how much easier it is to record quality music. You don't have to be in a studio to record quality music anymore. Um, you know, there there there's just so much and and like you said, you can release your own content. You can record your performances. You can put yourself out there. It would have been a lot easier. And and the labels don't really want to sign people. The labels just want a ready-made product. The labels, and it's always been this way. They want to look and see, like, this guy has an album recorded. He's already selling it. It's marketable. It's profitable. He's making money. So we know he's a sure thing. So we're going to sign him. We're going to have him re-record the album. We're going to get it mastered, and we're going to put it out, and we already know what's going to sell because we've already seen it done. Um, I remember listening to Bubba Sparks one time, and Bubba Sparks said we had already recorded the album and sold about 3,300 copies when the label signed us. And I remember thinking to myself, well, what do you need the label for? Yeah. And, and, and that's the question about. that answered itself. You, you really don't. You kind of confuse yourself into thinking that you need the label. You know, say what you want about Jay-Z. 
he gave us he gave us the blueprint uh, a long time ago of how to uh of how to market yourself and make yeah. yourself and and you know make yourself some money rockefeller bring up your own people bring up your own brand market distribution yourself you know i mean he signed with def jam obviously for the distribution but right. yeah i mean that's the only thing you really need a label for and this is 10 years ago obviously 15 years ago, you needed a label to get into record stores, right? You needed a label to, to be able to, to push you into record stores, which are a thing of the past now. Everything's digital. Everything's online. So you don't need a label. You can put your own music on iTunes. You can put your own music here and there. You know, you look at Chance the Rapper, and he's donating a million dollars to Chicago kids. You know, we had this conversation, like I said, last podcast. It's like that conversation, what, what sign label artists can do that, right? Because they all own their label so much from the advances, they all own their, own their label all their money. Like they don't, they don't have any money. And when you can do it yourself, build your own team like you guys have done, and and put it out there, you know, that you own a hundred percent of it. And exactly, you. What's the point? Like, I, I sit there and, and I I see the benefit of a label only because of marketing. Uh, they have obviously budgets that way exceed many of the startup artists in the world. Uh, I include myself in that category. Like, I mean, they're way, you know, there's, I can reach, you know, I have a generous following online, right? I can reach yeah. a few people. Um, but assigned artists, you know, everyone from Nicki Minaj to Drake to Lil Wayne, Jay, whoever, right? they tweet something out and it reaches millions and they kind of got to that level because they had like Def Jam behind them or they had, uh, you know, back in the day with Dre, like, you know, he was doing his own thing, but let's be real. Interscope was really pulling the strings for that. Right. You know, Jimmy Absolutely. Has and <clears throat> it's nice when you can be at least part of the boss, like, like Dre, Dre was part of the boss. Right. So he was making way more than any signed artist was cause he was doing the producing. He was doing the, the, the everything except for the di distribution. So he got, you know, he got paid, you know, first billionaire and rapper or how, however you want to put him, you know, 800 million still ain't shabby. Even if you want to be technical, uh, you know, you look at all that, like there's no, there's no sense for an artist today to sign with a label. I sit there and see artists that I'll give you two perfect examples. And, and I brought this up last time too. So I hate to be repeating myself, but you know, the topic kind of has gone full, full circle. And I feel like a lot of people have the same opinions, but remember when Entourage was on and Saigon and Saigon came out and he, he popped off with Entourage, right? Like, like, like you said, our, uh, labels want somebody that's already got something going, right? Right. Uh, he signed with, and I should have looked this up because I didn't have the answer last time. I thought it was Atlantic. I may be right. I may be wrong, but he signed with Atlantic or whoever. And all of a sudden he got buried, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I want to say he was having, um, uh, Just Blaze or Swiss Beats or one of them doing his, his produ production uh, and then Notoriously had a track that was supposed to have Jay on it and all of a sudden the label came back and said no you can't use Jay and you know and I, and I joked about this last time too but uh, that track later got released leaked released uh, not to say by, by who but we, we kind of know um, mm -hmm. but it took like what three years for Saigon's album to come out. Like they just sat on him because they didn't really know what to do with him. They had somebody with a lot of buzz, but then he got he he lost his buzz because it took forever for his album to come out. Uh, yeah, and 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 it, and just like the labels, watch what happens to you in the uh, what you do in the street as far as selling your and marketing yourself. I think I, I can't help but think the whole issue with him and Prodigy also hurt him as well. Um. You know, he had the issue where he was on the uh, the Smack DVD and he was stepping on the Mob Deep CD and he threw it down and stomped on it. Next thing you know, he's performing in the club and he gets jumped by Mob Deep on stage. He actually snuffed Prodigy pretty good before he got yeah. I remember, out I remember the video. Yeah, I, I always thought that, that hurt him because in the casual, the casual consumer like myself of Saigon at the time, who looks at him and says. Yeah, I, I don't know what's so special about him. I want to hear some music. After that happens, I don't really care what he has to say. I can't help but think that hurt him. But in fairness, that was probably about maybe even two years after he was signed. Yeah. Because they sat on him, he disappeared, and then all of a sudden he's making noise for the wrong reasons, like you said. Uh, 
I would argue that that's hip hop, you know, beef also and, true beef and whatever you, you want to call it. Uh, they took it a little bit further than just words on, on wax. But uh, and the other example I had was uh, a female rapper, Snow the, Snow the Product, right? Uh, she signed to Atlantic. I know for a fact it was Atlantic. And she had so much buzz, you know, Ola and all those, you know, quick, fast, hot tracks that she dropped a few years back. South Atlantic, they sat on her, sat on her. They didn't know what to do with her. They knew they had a hot act. They didn't know. Uh, and then, you know, just this last year, she started really releasing more music. You know, she's always been kind of YouTube-ish with her, with her vlogs and everything else. So people kept up with her and everything. It's not like people lost track of where she was, but there was no music right. coming out. And, you know, to your credit, you know, whether you guys have been making music or not making music, to kind of come full circle back to you guys, it, it it doesn't matter nowadays because a label would have sat on you too. You know, you, if they didn't yeah. know what to do with you, if they didn't have a, a clue what to do with you, if you were somebody that they never heard of and they just signed you because some A&R rep said, hey, this is the next big thing, there's no guarantee that you would ever got that opportunity. No, there's no guarantee because um, you have a lot of artists who – who gets signed to a label and they think that's it. Um, so it kind of goes both ways. If you get signed to a label and you kind of just sit around and be like, okay, that's it. We're here. What do we do next? That's when you find out the label doesn't know what to do with you either. You know? So you have to kind of keep pushing yourself and keep moving forward. You have plenty of guys who get sat on by the label, but they stay busy. They still do shows. They still make tour dates. They still continue to create music. Yeah. They still put out their own content their own way. And it kind of forces the label to either put the album out or get out of there. Um, that's why also I think management's really, really important. Oh, Not all time. artists are built to be businessmen. Yeah, big time. You know, uh, one of the things coming back to the insiders, one of the things that hurt us the most was that our manager uh, died in a car crash. Like during during some renegotiations, just as we were starting to, you know, come back together. You know, those guys have been tearing up the streets. I've been doing the B team thing. I've been doing shows in Virginia Beach. And we kind of started talking and listening to each other's music. Like, oh yeah, we still, you know, we can we can still do something. And um I remember he called me and he said, uh, you know, what would it take to get an insider's album together? And I remember telling him, I said, Hey man, at this point, I would want some type of creative control because I've proven that I can sell without those guys. That's just, you know, what I told him. I'm still young and arrogant about it. And then he passed three days later. And then three days later, uh, six days after that, the three of us who haven't spoken in, you know, maybe a year or so, were at the back of the church at his funeral laughing about it. And then we've been kind of like moving ever since. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's no guarantees ever. You know, I always oh, told them that we robbed ourselves of the chance to get lucky. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So we were prepared, but I felt like we never gave ourselves the opportunity. We never actually got to go out and and they didn't like doing shows very much. I'm like, we go out, we perform. Yeah, you guys never, we get never got to see your full potential. Right, right, right. You know, I never forget, I did a show in Virginia Beach where I took one of our group songs and I performed all three verses and I'm tearing it up. I'm on the waterfront, this club called Hammerheads. They have amateur night and I'm destroying it. And I remember the club owner coming to me and saying, can you be back here on Wednesday? And I remember looking at him saying, nah, man, I got to work. I got a job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had to beg to get off early on Friday to drive down here to do the show today. He's like, man, if you could be here on Wednesday and maybe Thursday, I could I could get you some opportunities. And I remember taking three, four days to think about it. And I don't regret the decision because at the time my job was pretty lucrative. You got bills to pay. I got bills to pay. You know what I'm saying? I I, I can't I didn't feel like I was polished enough as an artist to jump out the window that way. Cause that would have been me. That would have been so, oh, this guy's pretty good. We're going to sign him. Then what? You know, as a group, maybe as a solo artist, didn't feel ready at the time. Plus, I was doing okay just selling mixtapes. And then when you find out that a t-shirt, 
you make five times as much profit on t-shirt as you do on the mixtapes it, it it just it was a whole new revenue stream for me and i was ver- i was living very comfortably at the time and that was almost good enough yeah uh you know it, the thing is about potential is like you know there is people that get lucky breaks like you said and you know sometimes luck is preparation being ready for it and such and other people you know they grind away at it and it takes forever but those are the people that that the grind those are the ones that usually end up having the much more solid product too so they also don't get deterred very easy because they're doing it for themselves not necessarily for the fame so there's two sides to it uh but i do i do think it's kind of ironic you know social media now like you could have posted a track on, you know, Facebook, SoundCloud, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, whatever, right? And the whole world would have had an opportunity to hear it, right? And the ironic way of how, and even though me and you go way back, way back, uh, you know, mutual friends, different groups, but we've always seemed to be around each other, um, from playing basketball or uh, just hanging out. And, um, it's ironic because like I had known you for a few years at this point, and I'm going back to 2007, 2008, uh, when I was running Pure Style, and I, I had known you for a few years. And a mutual friend of ours, uh, Roy, you know, he he sat there and said, "You know, Brian raps, right?" And I'm like, "Man, get out of here!" Because you know, you never picture your friends as doing like big things, right? Like whether Absolutely. they're an actor or a music artist, like. You, you just don't. You, you see them as in one light, and you don't really see them as possible. And then when they do blow up, you're kind of surprised, also, right? Right. So, and it's not hating on somebody. Absolutely not. It's just, it's just kind of you, you. You take it for granted. I think it's probably a better way to put it. Um, and he, he, you know, he he told me, and he got a CD from you for me. And I, I'm not even going to bullshit you. I'm not going to kiss your ass. I blasted that CD for probably at least a good three months straight. You know, every time I was in the car, that CD was in. And I didn't tell you at the time because I didn't want to blow up your ego. But, <laughs> but, but no joke. Like I, I kept it on on repeat. You know, and and then we did the interview for for Pure Style. You mm-hmm. know, and it was a written interview, not like this. Uh, and. I'm still going back and forth whether I want to put the archives up on certified or not. Uh, I, I'm kind of all about this fresh start, but more and more people keep telling me that, you know, not only does it build credibility, obviously, you know, that you've been there and done this and done that, but it gives people an archive to go back and find this content that the only place you could ever find it is if I put it up. Right. So, um, right. <clears throat> so I'm still on the fence about that, but you know, Word of mouth is the only way back then that you could really get from A to B. Uh, you know, one person tells another, another person tells another, you blow up, and then, you know, maybe an A&R rep catches you at a show or somebody tells them, like, passes on the tape or CD, you know. And now, you know, so many artists, you could just click on SoundCloud and randomly somebody comes up. And that's the good part. The bad part is you don't know if it's going to be somebody good, right? Like you, you just don't. And looking back on, on the history that, that we have, and as well as I know you, uh, I think I can legitimately say that it'd be exciting to see a documentary come out about everything to build up. Just the stories you just told me just now. Uh, and that's one of the great things about doing this podcast, the way we're doing it. Cause it's not an interview. It's a conversation, you know, Joe Rogan, like if you will, you know, just kick back, talk like we would be on the phone anyway right um and nah I'm, i mean i'm genuinely excited like if, you, if you're gonna come out with a documentary like that i think that'd be must watch I, I definitely would advertise for people to put that out yeah and and it's just i you know we got to get the the it's it's a lot more work than i thought it was going to be like oh, i'm is. not going to say how many hours of old footage i have to sift through but you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of 90 minute tapes I have because I was there was a period of like four or five years I had the Sony Handycam and I was recording everything so I got like three shoe boxes I, these I remember TVs those days. to go through oh my god so much stuff to go through 
So it's 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 going to be a while before it happens. In the meantime, you know, gossip make, interviews with people who have family. Make sure you edit, have. Make sure you edit out any embarrassing basketball clips of me. All right, just just edit oh, those dude, out. Dude, dude, hey, hey, nobody, nobody's getting embarrassed. Everybody's getting, everyone's getting <laughs> big up on this thing, man. Um, I don't want you, know. you, you and Bobby and, and James and all y'all running up and down Wakefield courts. I, I don't want to see all that. I, I, I already I already came across a video of Bobby asking me to turn the camera off because I knew what happened next. So because he went know, nuclear, this, <laughs> yeah, because he went nuclear. He, <laughs> he, he didn't even say turn the camera off. He just looked at me like, "Hey, man, cut that real quick." And I'm already getting ready to put the camera down because I know he's about to go nuclear, and I'm the only one that can pull him off of whoever. You know, it's just it's it's fun times. Fun I always times. I always said Bobby would be the greatest professional wrestler I ever saw because. Somebody would just push him, and Mr. Calm, peaceful, like quiet as you want to be. Next thing you know, the top blows off. Boom. He, him, he, him and Roy he surprised both. a lot of people. Roy, uh, say yeah, Roy too. Speaking of which, yeah, he, he, they they used to surprise a lot of people. It's nice and calm, and hey yeah. man, everything's fine, everything's fine. And then you know the worst things get said. You see the competitive streak come out. That's all about Roy being starts doing the Euro step on people before the Euro step was popular, and it's just. <laughs> Come on, man. You know he's never traveled. Don't don't don't, don't get don't get my don't get my don't get my boy mad at me. Don't, hey, don't, Roy. Don't, love don't you, get Roy. Him at me. Love you, Roy. Roy <laughs> is the girl step before anybody else. That's yeah. that's all I'm gonna say about it. Yeah, Crab get, dribble too. We're getting a little personal here. Uh, like I said, longtime friends. Um, yeah. But speaking of hip hop, uh, let, let's hit on a couple other subjects. So yeah, one of one of the. Articles that I got coming out and a long time ago, you wrote this, you know, top 10 albums of all time. And I think you did an updated version for yourself later. But uh, one of the things I got coming out start of the year when the site launches and I mean, it's launching on January 5th. This this show will probably air about within like 10 or 15 days after that. Um, Definitely, this is going to be an early episode. But one of the things I'm writing about is state of hip hop in 2018 and It's not intended to be, and let me be very clear, it's not intended to be a older generation bashing on the new generation, uh, this parent parent generation versus that parent generation saying the next generation sucks, you know, it's not that. It it may come across a little bit harsh like that, but it's it's not that. It's about two things I find missing in most artists that I got really excited about in December, uh, with the albums, I, I gotta say December has probably been the best month this year, and maybe in the last couple years of albums dropping. Right, uh, mm-hmm. some some of the albums that have come out this year have reminded me about what hip hop is, was, and could be. And you look at, and this isn't a bash on uh, trap music or uh, people talking about whatever they want to talk about, or you know just instrumental beats that people just kind of like blah, blah, blah over. Uh, It's more about what happened to the lyricism in hip hop. Uh, More importantly, what happened to the storytelling? You know, we we all remember back in the day, you know, you talk about Jay-Z, we remember, you know, Reasonable Doubt and what it was like to live in the streets and the Marcy Projects. In, in my lifetime, how he told a story on every album about his life. And, you know, you, you got sucked into artists uh, like like Slick Rick, you know, how how catchy he was about running to the top floor and and Mona Lisa, you know, about the slice of pizza. And but the entire story and I can go back as far as you want to the beginning of hip hop and even catchy tracks like some of the Run DMC songs to 90s hip hop where no matter how gr- you know mob deep right like uh hell on earth like all these songs had a start middle and end and they all connected you and kept you entranced throughout the track right like you wanted to know how the story ended right uh and, and nowadays you don't see that in hip hop you you see a lot of people rapping about what they got or what they you know yeah. what they want, and, and and let's be clear, that's always been there, right? For every yeah, for every like song, you know, song cry that Jay Z made, there was a big pimping, right? Like there was a party track that that kind of got people in the door. Um, but you know, Friday on Elm Street, right? Like from the get, like very first track, like boom, the intro, fabulous, and Jada Kiss 
came out. Uh, another album that caught my eye, uh, J.R. Ryder from... Uh, uh, a lot of people don't know J.R. Ryder, but... The writer know, of writers. If you know hip-hop, you, you know J.R. Ryder uh, out of Harlem. Uh, he had his album drop. Uh, once again, I knew from the first few tracks, like, instantly, I'm like, bam, oh, my God, you know, real hip-hop. Uh, Kendrick dropped his latest thing. Uh, Big Sean dropped his mixtape, which was hit or miss, but some of the tracks that hit really hit. Um uh, and I, think- I got, I got, I got a few, I got a few thoughts on Big Sean right there. I, I, I do want to say this real quick. Yeah, go ahead. One of the things that I feel, I'm interviewing you, just, not the other way around. So go ahead. <laughs> one, one of the things I feel is, it's just a, it's just a, a theory of mine, and I'm open to being wrong or whatever. I used to call it slop hop. I used to call anything like mumble rap. Low brow music. I, I used to call it slop hop, and friends of mine would get upset about it. The thing is, I feel like we came up in a time where there wasn't so much social media, there wasn't so much instant gratification. You couldn't just go to YouTube and look at the funny parts of a movie. You had to watch the whole movie, hear the whole thing. So we have more of an appreciation. We're not going to get started. Whole- We're not going to get started with you and movies. You're still about twenty years behind on most movies, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's also true, but. <laughs> Because I was 20 years behind, one of the reasons I was 20 years behind on most music was because, I mean, on most movies, I was such a music enthusiast. So I would buy albums and I would listen to the entire album and I would I would listen to it till I knew every word of every song. And then I would write my own songs based off of that. And, you know, just I think our generation, we have more of an appreciation for that type of an art form, for music that makes us think for music that makes us wonder, for music that makes us visualize what these guys are talking about. You you listen to Mob Deep, you can you can even though I was never really a big fan of their music, I respected it. You can see what they're talking about, you can visualize it. And the artist that paints the better picture is always going to, you know, you're always going to enjoy them a little bit more for me anyway. Like I I hear Biggie yeah, talk. Absolutely, I can the see stories. Word. Jay-Z yeah. as well. I feel like this newer generation, because there's so much going on, because there's so much instant gratification, they don't want music that makes them think. They want music that lets them just not think. And I'm not saying that as a knock. I mean it. Like, music where the songs and the hook repeats over and over eight, nine times uh, for 16 bars, the same word. I, I, I I can kind of understand why you where the attraction is it took me a long time to get there i can never really get with it but it's just it's just there now i was listening to this eminem album and i think by the time this drops more people have heard it yeah and I'll, I'll, eminem, I'll agree with you right off the bat the second half is much better than the first but man, I, we, we listened to that entire album pillar to post every word we sat down the other day um between mixing down some of our old music and we just started listening to that Eminem album and like I said the first eight songs I was like what is he doing he's trying to reach out to these guys they'll they'll never accept him he's trying to reach out to people who will never accept him and the first eight songs was trash just all the way then that song with Alicia Keys gave me some hope and then 11 and 12 they're a little bit better one thing I did notice I always wondered why Dr. Dre got production credit for Eminem's albums when I knew that Eminem supplied and made a lot of his own beats. Yeah. Or the guys from D12 made them. Like, you know, I heard his demo tape. I'm like, whoa, you telling me, um, you telling me his, his first, I can't remember the name of the song, but, um, 313? No, no, no. The, uh, that dun, 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 dun. Dun dun dun! No, oh, guys, don't tip my tongue. Um, uh, whatever yeah. that song was, the insane one, like. Uh, and even my name is. Even my name is. Let's take my my name is. He pretty much had that beat way before he met Dre. So I'm like, why does Dre get producers credit for it? But then the production value of this album, I was listening to, it and I'm going, that's why. That's why Dre got credit because this album. It was not an album that I thought should have been produced by Dr. Dre production value wise. The quality, um, there were some things that were a little bit missing for me that I kind of, eh, 
something like I, that's some things that that an artist as you as an artist you hear and you go i don't like the way his voice is mixed i don't like the way the drums are mixed i don't like the distortion on the snare like just certain things like that but um we rolled off of the eminem album the next album to come up on apple music was g easy now i've never heard of g easy never wait, heard of him wait real quick before you go you talking about infinite no this was the the cursed and the damned oh, okay and um, apparently it just came out this week. No, I'm talking about the, the old track you were talking about. Oh, oh, the old track? No, 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 no. It was it was on his first, it was on the first Aftermath album. Oh, the first, the first like label album? Yeah, it was like these voices, these voices, I hear them and where they go, I'll follow, I'll follow. Like, I can't, I can't remember the name of the song. And that might be the demo version I was just singing. I want to, th- I want to say you're talking about. Either if I had or just don't give up. It was it's on that same album. It's on the same album as both of those songs. All right, we'll get it's back well, to it. But keep going. We'll, we'll, get, back we'll get back to it. Like or or we'll be done with this interview in like oh, you yeah. know, yeah. an hour and a half later I'm like, oh it was called, you know, whatever. Yeah. I, I was like racking my brain when you started going on to it. But anyway, you're talking about the new stuff, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I I'm listening to this G Easy guy, Oakland rapper. Yeah, I, I I just saw that come out, and like I said, we're recording this in December, so uh, forgive us. Um, it's towards the end of the month, but we are recording this. Um, and GZ just dropped his album, so I saw that pop up today. Um, listen to but the, I haven't listened to it yet. Listen to the first couple of songs. And I couldn't get past. There's a song on it called "Pray for Me," and I couldn't get past it. I couldn't get past how beautiful the music was, how well it was produced. How crispy and clean it sound, his lyricism, his flow, his delivery. The only problem I have with his delivery is I listen to it and I go, Big Sean really let so many of these rappers take his flow and run. <laughs> yeah. Big Sean, like, like, I don't understand I can see where you're going how with. he allowed that to happen because Big Sean has that da 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 like that's 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 that big thing. Da, 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 yeah, that's, that's that's his rhythm, yeah. It's flow. That's his rhythm, and so many people have just taken it and run with it. And you know, it gets to a point where it's not about who did it first; it's who did it better. So yeah, I was about to say, point, in fairness, they've probably been out about the same amount of time. Right, right, right. And and I don't know who did it first. I know I heard Big Sean do it. And I started hearing Drake do it. And I started hearing these other artists do the same type of flow. And when I hear g Easy, I hear Big Sean. But he's so clean with it, I'm not going to call him a biter or nothing like that. It's just time changing. I just feel like Big Sean should be a bigger star. He should be. For, but... for, the, for the impact he's had on hip-hop. Not whatever else, whatever other inkling or whatever other word I decide to call this type of music. Hip-hop, the the, the impact he's had on hip-hop, he should be a bigger star. Because the only reason I really feel Big Sean more than any others is because he's probably the one artist out today, minus the old school rappers that keep coming back. Um, and we'll come back to that article I was talking about in a second because I'll come back to the old school rappers. But he's probably the one that reminds me of 90s hair, hip-hop. Like, if you sit there and listen to some of his stuff, the way he kind of tells a story, right? I come back to that. Like, Big Sean, for the most part, you know, he grew up, you know, in Detroit. He grew up listening to Eminem. He grew up to listening to Jay-Z and all those guys. And he kind of mimicked that style for a little bit. He has his own style. But if you listen to the way he writes his lyrics and his stories... Uh, he mixes in some dance stuff and, and you know anything to kind of sell a record once in a while, like all of them do. But you know, and G Easy does the same thing. And the the thing G Easy gets kind of a bad rap for. And correct me if, if you think I'm wrong, but he gets a bad rap because he actually did some pop stuff, right? Like he did a song with Britney Spears. He did a song with you know a few other pop artists as like features, right? And I know why he did it because what's the quickest way to get your name out there, right? Do a feature with a pop artist. Now, Absolutely. Now 50 million people know who you are. Um, my wife. My wife loves him because of some of the features that he's done. And and you look at that. And if you listen to g Easy, and like I said, I haven't listened to this album yet. I will get to it pretty soon. I might even listen to, listen to it uh, on the drive today. But 
if you, if you listen to some of his old stuff, and I'm not talking about the releases, and you know we're talking about Eminem's old stuff. If you listen to some of G Easy's old stuff, he's always been really clean. Like you can, you know, you're talking about mumble rap. G Easy, you've always understood and been crystal clear, and his flow and his delivery has always been super clean. Yeah, I, I, I now like this is my first. I keep in mind, I never heard of him. I ain't never heard of him. G Easy, it's funny. When I hear a name like G Easy, I the first thing I do is I go and I listen to the music because I want to. To be honest, I want to give a, a a scathing review. I want to be like, oh man, this clown called G Easy, and his music was just this. And then I listen to him and it's like, oh, this guy's pretty good. You know, that's my gift for judging him by his name. The same thing happened with my favorite rapper. Uncle Murder. The first time I heard of Uncle Murder, and you know, I don't know which album you have, but you know I have the little skits on the album where I have little Stab You, and I'm making fun of, um, you know, Big Pump Money, Pimp and Mafia. I'm making fun of all these whack rapper names. I don't think I, I don't know if, if I had that one or if I just skipped the skits, because I've always been one of those guys that unfortunately, like, I'll listen to a couple of them, but then I'm like going to the music. Like, I'm all about the yeah, music. Yeah, no, so. no doubt. But um, well, I heard of Uncle Murder, Ironically, on the same on the same crack DVD <clears throat> that Saigon stepped on um, the Mob Deep album, yeah. there's a guy named Uncle Murder. I'm like, Uncle Murder? What the fuck is an Uncle Murder? And I go <laughs> and I listen to him, and within eight bars, I'm like, oh, this is my new favorite rapper. That's who he is. <laughs> you know, so G-Eazy was the same thing. I'm like, what the hell is a G-Eazy? What is this slop hop generation ball that's, oh my God, that turn on Pray For Me? And I'm like, oh. This guy is great. But the other thing that happens in hip hop, and it only happens in hip hop, it doesn't happen anywhere else. The more successful you are, the more you branch out, the more you diversify, the more you're vilified for it. Oh, absolutely. So you make a song that's completely street, completely gutter, and the radio picks up and goes, yo, we're going to play this song to death. It's like, oh my God, you're commercial, you're pop. You're this, you're, you're labeled as something so we don't have to give you credit for what you are. And it, I, I, he did a song with Britney Spears. For me, for a lot of people's instant reaction is, he did a song with Britney Spears. I can never fuck with him, regardless of whether this song is good or not. I hear he did a song with Britney Spears. I'm like, oh, he did a song with Britney Spears and he comes back and makes a song like this. This guy's a much more talented than I thought. Because he can diversify. And I don't understand why, you know, no being shade, able to do multiple things. No is, shade is, of, no oh. shade of Britney Spears has nothing to do with her, but he actually made her relevant again, to be honest, in that song. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, no shade of Britney. You know, Britney's Britney's a superstar, you know. It's, she's, it's nice to see her she, getting back. She's, to, she's earned her crown. Yeah, she she she's earned it. She's earned everything that she's gotten, you know. But I just don't understand why, you know, artists get vilified for doing songs that crossover or just doing the crossover song or doing a pop song in general. I don't understand why we have to be one thing and one thing only. The only person who ever escaped that, the only person who ever escaped that is 50 Cent. You know, for 50 Cent to bash Ja Rule for singing in hooks and then what would I be without you and songs like that and then turn around and doing 21 questions. I was like, come on, 50, that's messed up. But he got away with it. So I mean, 50's made a career out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, you, know, you can't bash Ja Rule for a style and then take it and <clears throat> run with it. So, yeah, I, I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> nah, Jeezy's he's dope. He, he's been dope. Uh, I'm looking forward to listening to the album. Like I said, I just saw it today because I was looking up something else and I was like, I was on Apple Music and I was like, oh, damn, I didn't even know that dropped. Like I said, December's been huge. You know, Jeezy, Eminem, Fab and Jada, J.R. Ryder, Big Sean, Kendrick. Uh, and I won't get too much tangent because I'm probably going to keep you for about another 15 minutes or so. I'm not trying to take too much of your time up today. Um, trying to keep most of these podcasts to around an hour. So like I said, we're going gotcha. to have to have heard on a, a bunch more times because as you can tell, the man the man knows what he's talking about. I'm not short on it. And the first episode, I really wanted to talk more about him. Uh, we've done it. Done, like I said, I've done a written interview with him before. But, you know, this is the first time a lot of people will be hearing hearing about you on this medium. Uh, so like I said, hip hop, like the biggest thing is like, you know, I feel like today's, you know, and this isn't a bash on it because I'm really optimistic going into 2018. That's kind of like where the article is going about how, you know, the way the year ended. I, I'm, I'm super optimistic about the way that, that things are trending towards 2018. Um, and here we are in 2018 when this, this show airs. Uh, 
I'm really excited about hip hop in 2018. I haven't been this excited in a few years. And maybe it's just because I'm hot off all these December releases. But I will say there's at least there's hope in the air and that and, and there's nothing wrong with let me let me be clear. I'm kind of like you. There's nothing wrong with today's hip hop. People like what they like. They're still selling millions of uh, tracks. Everybody's getting paid. Uh, every young kid I see on the block is, is rocking the, the latest hip hop uh, artists and stuff. Um, hell, I even rocked out to Panda for a little bit this year. Um, oh, <laughs> I couldn't understand half of what he was saying, but man, that beat was sick. And <laughs> and you get you get you get sucked in. Like sometimes you just need a good anthem, right? And so yeah, yeah. So I, I was feeling that, but. My, my whole thing was like, you know, I'm optimistic about where hip hop's going. I'm optimistic about about some of the potential. And, you know, I did want to get your opinion on that. And you just gave it to me a little bit. So that's awesome. Uh, I'm definitely going to get you back on, especially uh, in the new year, a few times uh, to further talk about the subject. Because I know we could go hours and hours talking about hip hop. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, but I also want to give you a chance for you to plug your podcast. Um, Yo, yeah, talk about um, her house. Hertz tell, House. Tell people Hertz where House. they can find it and all that good stuff. Hertz House is heard exclusively on True Radio Network. That's T-R-U Radio Network. Uh, TrueRadioNetwork.com. Um, subsidiary of Blog Talk. We're on every Wednesday night from 8 till whenever. Uh, some of the best thing about, you know, being uh, a partner in your own company is you, you, you know, I don't have to say it's a two-hour show. We usually go hour, hour and a half or until it gets, you know, the point gets across. I've done shows that last five minutes. I've done shows that go two and a half hours in the overtime. But yeah, every Wednesday night, uh, the phone number to call in is 347-884-9299. That's 347-884-9299. Um, or you can go to trueradionetwork.com. Just remember, it's T-R-U. You can follow me on Twitter at Hertz House, as Mike said earlier. Uh, Facebook, Brian Carr. Um, and they'll say, a.k.a. Big Hurt. And, um, you know, we got some um, some pretty cool things planned for 2018. My show, typically around football season, is mainly a Redskins podcast. And then things happen that I don't feel like talking about sports, so we might delve into politics. Just a little um, word of advice, people. Don't say RG3. <laughs> you know, you can say RG3, but don't say RG3 because you're talking about Kirk Cousins. So, so let me and ask you. need a crutch. While, while we got an opportunity real quick, let me ask you about this. So Yeah. And I'm sure you've covered this on your podcast, so maybe this is a bigger chance to plug your podcast. How did you guys react to this week uh, when he was on ESPN rounds, like doing the rounds on the shows? Because I thought, and because I'm going to get this in real quick, because I know this is going to lead you on for a few minutes. I thought, honestly, he presented himself well. Like, he presented himself, especially when I saw him on, uh, not Mike and Mike anymore, against my against my will on that one, but uh, Wingo and Golik, um <clears throat> Which, by the way, I, I I'll say this publicly: Trey Wingo, Mike Golick. To me, they're just too much of the same. There's no contrast. It's not hating on either guy. I love Mike Golick. I think there's other people on the network that could have been a better contrast to Mike Golick. But I know the situation behind the scenes that he wanted somebody he was comfortable with. So it is what it is. But you know, he was on there and he presented himself well. Every time they tried to put him in a position to say, hey, what teams you want to play for, whatever, he just rolled it off, like, you know, wherever I can have a legitimate chance to compete. Um, he's taken the year to kind of better himself. Uh, he didn't come off as cocky. He didn't come off as arrogant. He didn't come off as anything the Washington media has dubbed him for the number of years. <sighs> Man. Um, he didn't even bash He didn't even bash the Shanahans, which, you know, they've kind of quoted him a couple times, which is, I guess, allegedly supposed to have been off the record and they put on the record, but... Uh, you know, he took he took the high road on a lot of stuff on national TV, which is the way you got to do it. Um, but yeah, I, like I'll end it with this. I thought he looked really presentable, and maybe that he should get an opportunity somewhere. Obviously, not Washington. This is a bad market for him. Uh, too much bad blood, but somewhere for a bad market. Period. Actually, but um, when it comes to RG three, one of my biggest complaints was that. I knew people who knew RG3. I've spoken with multiple people, and they all said the stuff that was going through the media was horseshit. They were like, uh, I'm like, yo, so he doesn't have an ego? They say he has as a big of an ego as any player in the locker room. Yeah, of These course. guys are the elite few. They are the best of the best. You know, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of football players in college, and then you have hundreds of hundreds and hundreds who make it to the NFL. They're the most 
this the most physical athletic profession in the world. So yeah, there's going to be an ego. So for them to say he has an ego and put especially, it out there like he's the only one who has it. Especially as a starting quarterback. You have especially, to have him. Especially as a starting quarterback. And not necessarily an ego, one, but, but a confidence to, to lead your team. Yeah, uh, a confidence to lead your team. One of the worst team, one of the worst franchises in the last 15 years or so. For him to come in and give them immediate success – at 22, 23 years old, of course he's not going to deal with it the right way all the time. But so many things were passed on as fact. There was so much jealousy. There was so much back talking and fighting. So when he came on this week and he presented himself the way he did, you had so many people going, oh, that's not really him. What's really him is what these anonymous sources who never put their name to paper gotta love that, him right? to be. Gotta love yeah, that. yeah, but but the truth of the matter is, this we, is who he's could, always been. We could rant for an hour on anonymous sources. I know that, but go ahead. Yeah, and, and you know it's funny in, in my line of business, I get anonymous information all the time as well. I get yeah, all of us say, too. yeah, yeah, and and I always bashed it until I got anonymous sources. But the only anonymous stuff I report on my show are things that will or won't pan out. I had someone who reached out to me and said, um, when we were interviewing for Joe Barry, the worst coordinator, when we were interviewing for Joe Barry and the Redskins said, we're going to interview Vic Fangio, I had an anonymous source reach out to me and say, yo, this is reportable. Joe Barry already has the job. The interview of Nick Fangio is just to appease the fans. Jay Gruden wants Nick, he wants Joe Barry. He's getting Joe Barry. Trust me on that. And then it panned out four or five days later. So, like, those are the only type of stories I report. When I get reports of this person doesn't like this person or this person said, it's not something you can ever confirm. I feel like it's irresponsible to report that. So the report that the offensive line doesn't like RG3 or RG3 says this about Mike Shanahan or that about Mike Shanahan, you know how many people were surprised when um, Mike Shanahan did his interview on 106.7 and he said, you know, the rumors about me saying this and that about the playbook is truly false. And I don't know who could have put it out there because I still talk to Kyle. I still talk to Mike. I still talk to Matt LaFour. And we're all on the same page. The host was like, you still talk to Mike and Kyle? He goes, I just talked to Kyle Shanahan last week. It's like, oh, so all <laughs> the media that we've been hearing about how much you hate the Shanahan's and how much you danced on Mike Shanahan's grave when he got fired, that can't be true because, as Mike Shanahan said himself, he suggested to Jeff Fisher that he give RG3 a workout. You know, like, they, they still talk. So they sit around and they look at these reports and they go, this ain't true. Look at this bullshit they're reporting. But in the meantime, the, the consumer is hearing these reports and they're getting the RG3 take the upper hand of uh, the upper road and uh, and 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 be the bigger man and he's being quiet about it. So they're going, if you're being quiet about it, then everything I'm hearing over here must be true. Yeah. And I feel like it's a it's a disservice. There's, so, no, de- there's no denying it and then all of a sudden people steamroll with the story and even if he did deny it, let's be real, people would just think he's lying and protecting himself. You know, my thing about anonymous sources has always been it's okay to report something that some anonymous source gave you, but report it as rumor. Don't report it as fact because if somebody can't put their name on it, then you're putting your name on it, which makes you responsible for it. So I've always reported it as rumor or I've heard. Um, I've never come out and say, hey, this is going to happen as a fact because an anonymous source said it. Uh, this is what some people are whispering. And I'll, I'll say it like that. I necess- don't even necessarily quote an anonymous source because – I just feel so dirty about it. Like if you can't, like if you can't put your name on it, then then I don't really want you telling me. I, I right. guess that's kind of kind of the way I look at it. But as far as RG three goes, I mean, let's be real. And I think football people know this better than than any fan. Um, this isn't a Colin Kaepernick situation. This is a guy who can't stay healthy situation, right? Um, right. His rescue career ended basically with a concussion. Um, yeah, they were trying to push him out there. They played him at safety in practice, like. Yeah, let's be, but let's be real. You know that knee injury in his first season, on top of the knee injuries in college. You look at when he went to Cleveland last year. He could have been a savior in Cleveland. Uh, he could have got his whole career on track if he could have just stayed healthy. Um, two things about that. Number one, his Redskins career ended um, because Jay Gruden did not want him as a quarterback. 
And yeah, he went but... he went through lengths to make him look horrible in a preseason game. And I'll never as much as I like Jay Gruden's playbook, I'll never forgive him for that. You know, when they sent Kirk yeah, Cousins he took, down, he took to, way uh, too many hits, and you saw Cousins didn't take those same hits. I agree. Yeah, he, he he sent he sent Kirk Cousins down to work with his brother. I already knew the fix was in, and the first big anonymous report I ever got that I, I actually reported was when someone told me he said, "Yo, Kirk Cousins has assurances that he's going to be the starter for the Redskins," and I reported that before the Detroit preseason game. That was the game where we had the left tackle the starting left tackle who was working at a Walmart three days before the game as your starting mm-hmm. left tackle gave up three sacks and then we never saw Robert again. That yeah. That's, you know, so I always looked at that as, okay, you know, there's something funny going on here, number one. Number two, I remember RG3 was on 106.7 last week. That's the local station here in D.C. Uh, he was on the station last month and they were like, you know, you couldn't stay healthy in Cleveland. And he said, well, you know, my Cleveland football career ended off of an illegal hit. People say I don't slide. People say I don't get down. I was three steps out of bound, and I got hit with an illegal hit after I, w- I already taken steps to protect myself. So how is that really my fault? And I well, that's both I, tr- that's both true and false because that that's how he got hurt in the beginning of the year. Well, no, he's talking about the, he said the last hit he took in Cleveland was an illegal hit. Uh, I or, remember, I, or, remember, I remember him getting hurt. But that was like what week three or whatever. Uh, he was because I remember famously speaking of the fan, you know, Chad Dukes would always joke that, you know, he was going to a game in Cleveland that year and he was hoping Robert would be healthy. And then of course the week before, you know, they were supposed to come to DC or whatever. You know, he was yeah. he was he got he got hit and taken out. But that was that hit. If I remember, I mean, I could be. Oh, okay. Wrong. I, that, I could, but but I, I remember it being like that was the major hit that put him out for like ten weeks or whatever. And then he came back like the last couple of the weeks because they had every other quarterback on the roster hurt. So they came back and played a couple weeks. Just, just I want on the record, you know, Cleveland hasn't won a game since they let RG three go. Number one, and uh, number two, Terrell Pryor was much better with RG three as his quarterback than uh, he was here. So it's weird. Did, did, it's uh, weird. Did uh, so that one win they had in the last two years that was with RG three. RG three was the last person. He was the only person to get Cleveland to win in the last two years. I knew they. Were, I knew they were like one and whatever during Hugh Jackson's last couple of years. I didn't. I didn't know that. I didn't R- know RG three was, was the one when he. W- they were. They were doing pretty well in the game when he got hurt. I'll catch. Fi- then, I'll catch fire for this right now. Terrell Pryor is a better quarterback than Kirk Cousins. But um, I don't think Kirk Cousins is a bad quarterback. Um, I think he's. I think he's above average. I think. I think he has. A great system built for him. I think he makes misreads sometimes. I think he does high throws. I can say that as a Giants fan, I can say the same exact things about Eli Manning. You give him time to make plays, he will make those plays. You rush him sometimes. Sometimes that ball goes high and ends up in the wrong hands. And yeah. and like I said, I say the same exact things about Eli Manning. Uh, I think Kirk Cousins, and Eli Manning are very similar. If you want to want to put, you know, comparisons. Eli just went to a much better franchise. Yeah, and had a lot of luck with a healthy offensive lines early in his career, um, and had one of the greatest coaches of all time because uh, Tom Coughlin. Tom Coughlin, man, he, I mean, besides saving Tiki Barber's career, he knew how to coach guys up and get the most out of them. That's something Jay Gruden has failed to do in four years. In four years, Jay Gruden has developed two people. Kirk Cousins and Chris Thompson. Yeah. That's I, it. I've been a critic of, of Tom Coughlin for years, but I will say this. We grow up, we are living in an era, you know, you can call it the millennials or whatever you want, um, where people don't like to be challenged, right? They break. Right. They, you know, you push them, they break. Uh, I remember famously, you know, he pushed Mike, Mike Strahan when he first got there about being late to practice, even though he was on time. Or late to a meeting or something like that, even though he was on time. And he's like, you know, he did the famous line, you know, five minutes early is on time. Being on time, you're late. And, you know, he would find people and push people. And he – and this is the one thing I will give Tom Coughlin the most credit for. He adjusted, right? He, yeah. He went from his militaristic, this is the way it's going to be, to maybe that didn't work in Jacksonville. I started doing this in New York. Maybe I need to adjust. And his teams have always been successful. He took Jacksonville, an expansion franchise, to the AFC Championship. He has always been a great you know, strategist, if you will. And he does know how to get the most out of people. 
but you have to be willing to listen. And the one thing about Jay Gruden, I've kind of said the same thing. You know, he's he's a good strategist. Uh, I like his offensive scheme sometimes, even though you mentioned earlier you kind of have questions about it. He's made a lot of unknown players, you know, known, right? You know, the Crowders, the – the um, what's the other receiver? Number four, Ryan Grant. Um you know, he's made the most out of players like Vernon Davis see, when Jordan Reed can't stay healthy. Yeah. Um, and I'm, we can have another hour episode on Jer- Jordan Reed. But um, <laughs> uh, the, and we will have more time than he does on the field. Yeah, the shoulda, coulda, woulda of uh, uh, Jordan Reed's career. Um, and I don't think it's over, but I don't think you can depend on him anymore. It's over in Washington. He's, he, I, he, he I don't think they that. can afford to get rid of him. I don't think anybody will take him. Um, and that contract he has that he signed that extension – I don't, I don't think anybody's going to touch him. Uh, but back to, you know, RG3, it's like this guy, whether it's the hits that were illegal, whether it's the knee injuries in both college and the pros, you know, that first season, you know, people people condemn the coaching staff for letting him play with that torn ligament in his knee. I look at it the other way. You couldn't keep him off the field. Uh you talk about people question RG3's heart. Look at that game. He he made those coaches let him go back in that, that game. Like he hopped off the sideline and ran back in that game, even though the coaches were like, no, you're hurt. Stay down. Um, and then Shanahan, I don't think Shanahan was ever the micromanaging type. I think he, he grand schemed things, and he probably didn't know to the extent. I still don't think to this day, and I could be wrong. I don't think he knew the extent that RG3 was furthering risking his career when he did that. Right. Um, but, you know, RG3 has never been the same since. And he's never – the one criticism I've always had about RG3 is that he's never put on the weight. He's never – like you look at him, and I don't think there's a skinnier quarterback in the NFL. Like he's never put on that muscle and that, that physical – look at Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson runs a lot. Russell Wilson skits out, but when he gets hit – he gets, he's probably bigger than half the linebackers hitting him sometimes. His shoulders are so wide. Like, you have to – if you're going to be a quarterback that – and RG3 mentioned this the other day. He wants a system where he can use his arm and his legs, right? You right. have you have no legs. Like, if you get hit, your legs are getting broken in the NFL. You're so thin. And when when is he going to eventually put the work in the weight room? To, well, to build you know, up that body to make sure he can stay healthy for a full 16 game. You know, uh, it's weird because Mike Shanahan said the opposite. Mike Shanahan said that the problem he had with RG3 was that RG3 was putting – he said RG3 was putting in the work. He said RG3 put in a lot of work to get his body into a much better position. He he put on about you know 10 or 15 pounds, which I never saw. I agree with you. I never saw that weight. But he said he felt like RG3 should have put more time in in the film room. And that's where him and RG3 disagreed. RG3 said he thought he put in plenty of time in the film room. Um, and, you know, Mike Shanahan said Kirk Cousins is the one who puts in that film room time. And um, RG3 was more worried about his body. I felt like he should have been with, you know, all the hits he was taking. I agree with you. I never <clears> – <throat> the weight that Mike Shanahan says he put on, I never saw it. I never I never looked at Robert and said, oh, man, he's – He's getting a little bulkier. He's he's kind of growing into his NFL body. Yeah, okay, cool. I never saw it. I don't think we ever will because he'll always be a guy who relies on his speed. I mean, his even calf, though he wants his, to be, his calves are smaller than my forearms. I mean, dude, like it. I don't know. I'm not gonna. I'm not looking too much at a, at a, at a guy's mid region, but. I don't think he has the biggest thighs either to take some of these hits either. And yeah, and that's always been my bad criticism. My criticism has never been of Robert's talent. It's never been of his ego and behind the scenes because I can name a million crazy players that still produced. Uh, look at Terrell Owens. Uh, mm. Look at Randy Moss. Look at uh, there's a number of headaches that have been in locker rooms that if you're talented enough, it doesn't doesn't matter. They they will put you on the field. Um, Lawrence Phillips. You want to talk about you know. Uh, people that are talented enough to keep coming on the field, no matter how much off the field shit they do. RG3 has always kept his nose clean. He hasn't gotten in trouble with the law. He hasn't done anything Never. wrong. And, and stand he, up, stand up guy. But he got caught in a civil war, right? He got caught in a team that hasn't been to a Super Bowl since 1991. Has barely stiffed the playoffs a few times in a city that demands and wants and craves more than their local franchises have given them in every sport. Um, 
it's gotten to the point where this city used to win championships or at least be competitive in the playoffs every year. And now every team, minus maybe the Nats, has been a letdown. And the Nats in, in the playoffs are a letdown. You know, the Wizards are starting to make noise, but they haven't gotten over the hump in the playoffs. And the Caps have notoriously never gotten over the hump in the playoffs. Um, the Redskins are the one team that has given the city multiple championships. Um, the Wizards haven't won one since the 70s. Um, so, yeah, I, I can see where the hunger comes from from the franchise. Like, I'm not – I'm one of those people like, hey, do you like every one of your neighbors? No. I don't like the way this, the team is run. I don't like the ownership. I don't like – I don't even like the color scheme to be honest with you. So, <laughs> so you know, I have no reason. As a little kid, I jumped on the Giants bandwagon, and I've been a fan now for yeah, 32 years. So I've earned my stripes. I know who Ray Hanley is. I know who, passed the, who Bill Parcells passed the baton to. I, I know about some of the, the Kent Grahams and Dave Browns of the world. Um so I'm a real fan. But the one thing that's always bothered me about the RG3 situation is that it wasn't his fault. He got totally caught in a civil war between people that wanted your prototypical quarterback in Kirk Cousins, and it's not a bash on Kirk Cousins because he's successful, versus people that got caught up in the hype of RG3 that he can never quite go beyond his rookie year, right? So Right. And – it's just not fair to him, but that's that's the life. That's the way the world works. And, you know, I don't even think it should be a debate in D.C. because he's been gone a couple years now. Um, but it always will be as long as Kirk Cousins is here because yeah, they, dra- because they got drafted together. One of the other problems that you have with Redskins fans is if you if you look at Kirk Cousins and you say, yo, he was high on his throw, um, you know, he sailed this too far. Look, look at this. He's staring down the receiver. After the third criticism of Kirk Cousins, it turns into, oh, you're just mad because RG3 is gone. If RG3 was here, that would have been a sack fumble. This would have happened. I, it, it, that's what it turns into. It, he's used as a shield to protect Kirk Cousins. He's used as both. He's used as a shield. He's also and used a sword. As a, yeah, because people stab Kirk Cousins because he's not RG3 and he's not as beloved, right? I mean, Kirk Cousins is kind of love, but he's also, you know, he's thrown for 4,000 plus yards a few years in a row. So people kind of respect him. Uh, and I think I think you're right. You said earlier, you said, what happens if he's gone? Who's next? And that's why the Redskins kind of got to keep him around, right? You know, same thing with Jay well, Gruden. Like, if, if, if he goes, who's next? You know, what do you have to replace them? Uh, the Redskins don't have a backup plan to replace Kirk Cousins. I would say there are several decent quarterbacks in the draft, but I don't think there's one that I, I've fit, I've been campaigning for the Giants to take one of those top picks and and take Mayfield, right, and, and keep him behind Eli for a year, let him learn the way Aaron Rodgers learned, let him learn the way Steve McNair learned. Like some of these quarterbacks back in the day, they didn't – McNabb, none of them started their rookie years, right? They all right. They all had to sit behind a veteran for a year, learn the NFL, and then they came in and caught fire because they were ready. Um, I would love to see Baker Mayfield come in with a team like the Giants, who has all the talent in the world around him, take a year for the Giants to build up that offensive line, build up that defensive front, build up, uh, and then let Eli ride off into the sunset a little bit, not like this bullshit that happened this year. Um, coincidentally, one game before he tied his brother's streak, uh, though I do think that was Eli's decision. He, he had a choice of, of moving aside. That never made any sense to me because if you're going to move aside, do it for the future. You say Davis Webb's the future. Why is Geno Smith starting? For Geno, for Geno Smith, no. Yeah, yeah. I was feeling the same thing. I was yeah. feeling the same thing. I'm like, okay, if he's going to set down for Davis Webb. Cool, Geno Smith. I thought Eli should have been benched a few times this year. I'm a fan. I thought he should be benched. But do it for the future. If you're if you're two and whatever at this point, I think we're two and nine at the point. Like you're not going anywhere. You say this kid is the future. You drafted him in the third or fourth round. Let's see it. Let him play. Let him get his reps. You know, the Giants were the Giants had a winning record when, when Eli Manning took over for Kurt Warner. People forget. The Giants started off five and one that year. I think they were like five and three, five and four when we had lost a couple games. And they took Warner out and put in and this is pre Warner going to the Super Bowl with the, the Cardinals. So Warner wasn't done. You know, they took him out and put in Eli Manning as a rookie and let him take his lumps, and we didn't win another game the rest of that year. Um, 
if that's the case, we're already losing. Why not put Davis Webb in? It, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and Eli didn't want to do a half game. He didn't want to do like, oh, I'm going to start to keep the streak alive and then come out. So, because he respected his brother too much, he didn't want to break his brother's streak that way. I respected, uh, I respected that move very much by Eli. By the way, I respected that move very for him to say, "Oh, you, you want to start me just for the record?" No, no, no. I, I respected the hell out of that move, and it blew me even more that one game later they came back to him. That just wasn't fair to him. And and just to just to quiet down the media and. Like I said, we hear it here in D.C. It's it's different in New York. Uh, let's be clear. Eli Manning's not going anywhere. People keep saying, oh, he'll be traded really? to Jacksonville. He'll be traded to this and that. Eli Manning has gone on record several times about how he has a no-trade clause. He doesn't plan on letting anybody enforce it. His family's in New York. He has a house in New Jersey. His kids are in school. He's perfectly happy in New York. And I, I do believe... Like, people always talk about Jacksonville because of Tom Coughlin. I do believe that Eli would retire before he went to anywhere else. Now, what's funny about that is— And it'll cost have, him $15 million to cut him. Ooh. What's funny about that is we have the opposite issue here in D.C., where the last anonymous source reporting that I did was someone who told me and has told me since the end of 2015— Kirk Cousins will never sign with the Redskins. No, he didn't he even will, negotiate last time. He will never. Yeah, and, and what I said at the time, I said at the end of the 2015 season that Kirk Cousins will never sign with the Redskins. And I reported it. And a lot of people told me, I, a lot of people I respect in the media came out and said, I know where you got that from, but we don't believe that. I said, you know, we'll see. And as the year went on, they're talking about negotiations, and then he kind of fell through. I kept asking my source, are you sure? And he never came up off. He said, Kirk Cousins will never sign. So this past offseason, when they made him an offer for $90 million, and he turned it down. I mean, I'm sorry, he turned it down and then didn't put in a counter offer. I said, oh, my source knows what he's talking about. He, he has no intention. I don't even think that. he turned it down. I just don't think he responded to it. He just left it, <laughs> left yeah, it he on just, the table. Just, yeah, just, yeah, you know, you know, I think you're right. He didn't, no response. No, they looked at the, they looked at the offer and said, yeah, no. You know, let's see what happens. But then um, a, th- a couple weeks ago, his father told Sports Illustrated that Kirk Cousins wouldn't have signed with the Redskins even if they offered him the biggest contract in NFL history. And that's not an anonymous source. That's his father saying it. Yeah. And the D.C. media never touched it. The D.C. media never touched um, his father saying that. that doesn't because play to they their report narrative. what they want. That doesn't play to their narrative. They, they, want, they want to give the fans hope that he's going to stay. And no, they, well, no, they want to play no, both they, sides so they can get the controversy. No, they, they really they really want to play to the narrative that the owner isn't doing everything he can do to sign Kirk Cousins because he loves RG3. The, the, they still play that narrative. I also say, Sports. and, and this, will, this will be the last thing real quick, and I will absolutely let you go because uh, we're running a little bit long. But I will also say it depends on what station you listen to. So if you listen to True. the Dan, Dan Snyder own station – you get the opposite narrative, right? And if, no, actually, and if you listen to the the fan, then you get the people because they're obviously not owned by Dan Snyder. They can say whatever the hell they want. Um, and a lot of times it's the opposite of you. I've listened to like Cooley and, and Doc Walker and some of those other guys, and, and they constantly put the onus on Kirk Cousins not getting what he wanted or not. Like they make it seem like he could still sign, but they, they make it seem like he just doesn't want to be here. And – and whereas the, the the fan, they make it seem like, well, ownership's not giving him enough. That That's true. But, yeah, in the end, it all comes down to, you know, Kirk is the victim somehow. You know, some somehow he's being done wrong. The problem with 980 is they went out the window. Ooh. They went out the window to say that, you know, to endorse Kirk Cousins over RG3. So you endorse Kirk Cousins, and now Kirk Cousins doesn't want to be here. It kind of messes with your credibility. Yeah. So, you know, they 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 want to paint a pretty picture, but the colors are all over the place. And the writing's on the wall. Kirk Cousins is either going to be – he's not going to go to Cleveland. He's going to go somewhere where it's ready-made so he can start winning. Like, 
I thought San Francisco had the chance. Well, that's but he done has now. to look <laughs> over at San Francisco, not even because of Jimmy Garoppolo. He has to look over at San Francisco and go, man, uh, they're not really doing so well. I think Denver. I don't know because San Francisco was in every almost every game they lost this year. And maybe Garoppolo is the difference because they didn't, you know, Brian Hoyer and uh, – uh, what's his name? I'm sorry. Uh, the other quarterback that took over for Hoyer. Um, uh, why am I drawing a blank? Uh, but before Garoppolo got there, and all of a sudden now Garoppolo comes in and they win three straight. Um, yeah, I mean that team. That team's missing a few pieces, but they're not all that bad. And I, I don't know. I think Kirk Cousins could have definitely done great things with there, and that, they're winning now without Garcon too. Like Garcon's are he's on the IR, so. Uh, Garcon, Garcon was. Um, I'm not gonna say anything bad about Garcon because a lot of Redskins fans feel like you know, oh, we should have paid Garcon and Deshaun Jackson. They're the reason for all of our woes. When Garcon's not Grant, worth the, Garcon's not worth the money, but he is a reliable. Like he's, he's a reliable. He's, he's a Anquan, reliable third he's that, down receiver. Yeah, he's that Anquan Bolden, that guy that's gonna get those tough yards to make those tough catches, uh, not be afraid to go over the middle. Uh, you need a few guys like that. Um, he's a far cry from his Indianapolis days where he was taking, you know, 60-yard bomb touchdowns. But, you know, he, he's, he's one of those guys I think can still play four or five more years as a reliable receiver. I don't yeah. think he'll ever, after this injury, I don't think he'll ever get paid that way again. But yeah. Right, which is why I'm always for guys getting paid when they can for, for this reason. Oh, absolutely. Um, NFL, well, you, you know, got to get your money. When it's all said and done, our third string wide receiver has more touchdowns than Garcon and Deshaun Jackson put together. So I don't look at that as an excuse for Deshaun's why we're moving can't, backwards. Can't, can't stay on the field. Um, yeah. Every hit, he's, he has to leave the field. He, he he's he's. I don't know how he's doing as far as staying in the, on the field during the games, but I know he's, he's starting these games this year. He's just not. Well, he's doing He's a one thing. trick pony. He's doing a well, he's a one trick pony, but he's also doing the same thing. And and this is we go back to RG three, right? This is the same thing. Every time you touch Deshaun, and I, I've watched a few Tampa games, you know, through NFL and network and everything else, uh, or Sunday ticket and everything. Like every time you touch him, and for fantasy purposes too, I, you know, I'm a fantasy junkie like everybody else. Every time, yeah. and we'll spend another hour talking about fantasy, but. Uh, Every time you touch him, he has to go off the field. He seems to get hurt every time he gets tackled. And then he'll come back a couple plays later, limping or, or whatever. And Deshaun's one of those dudes. Like, when, when are you ever going to put the weight on? When are you going to ever get yourself an NFL body to go with all those natural gifts that you have? And Deshaun Jackson can blow. And maybe he's afraid of not be, having the speed if he puts on weight, right? And that's a that, that, that could be a real thing. But when I see you go out of the out, off the field every other play – how reliable can you be? And Tampa's finding out the hard way. Luckily, they got other targets, you know, like Mike Evans, who's a monster, and Cameron Brate's kind of coming into his own. So they got some weapons. You know, Doug Martin's kind of disappeared after the suspension, but, you know, they, they have offensive line and other kind of trouble. You know, I can spend another hour talking about offensive line too. But uh, I will let you go. I, I do want to thank you for coming on, being on one of my early episodes. Hey, man, thanks for having me. I definitely got to have you back more often. I think next time we'll probably spend more time talking about one subject or the other. But being the first time I had you on, I really want to let people know how diverse and how <laughs> – I mean, we talked about basically the Redskins and hip-hop. But, man, let me tell you, people, this guy knows everything about everything. Uh, we could talk politics. We could talk music. We could talk every other football team, baseball team, basketball team. Maybe not baseball, but – Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not baseball. Maybe. Maybe. But, maybe. but by the way, uh, tax overhaul just got passed. Yay. <laughs> just just to date just to date this for people who are hearing it like right now as we speak the tax overhaul just got passed well so. I, de I definitely won't i got i gotta i gotta get going so i, I don't want to get on that side track um gotcha <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah no uh ladies and gentlemen uh make sure you check out Hertz house follow him on twitter at Hertz house uh for my sake, Brian, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on, and I'll talk to you soon, buddy, all right? No problem, man. Later on. All right, man. You have a good one. Thank you. All right, you too.